here knocking down the, bringing down the house as I punched it in my Google to look up this picture. <coughs> Samson was bringing down the house, wasn't it? <clears throat> We've talked some about how that he was a Nazarite from his birth, and so there were certain things God required of a Nazarite. And one of them was he wasn't allowed to cut his hair during the days of his vow. And unless he had violated his vow. And we saw how really in uh, truth he kind of violated that vow whenever he went into that carcass of a lion and got the honey out. And, uh, but he tried to keep that secret. He tried to keep it a secret and didn't let his parents know, and he tried to just get away with it. And I think it needs to be said that the secret of Samson's supernatural strength, though the Bible tells us this, these details of how they were trying to get Samson to somehow expose himself, by saying, uh, well, if you bind me with new ropes, or well, if you do this, we do that. And if, it's, it's so easy to get Catholic y in our thinking. Baptists are just as bad as Catholics when it comes to superstition and being superstitious. Uh, the marriage, divorce, and remarriage is a superstitious issue for most Baptists. There's a lot of things that. Baptists just can't get right because they just in their thinking they're just so Catholic in their concepts and it's sad and the truth is uh, the secret of Samson's supernatural strength I think it's important that we go ahead and say this that his real secret was God amen <laughs> 1 Corinthians 16 verse 11 Here we have a beautiful verse. Did I say 16.11 again? Man, it's funny how 16.11 keeps showing up in the Bible, isn't it? I wonder what somebody's trying to tell us. Well, in 1 Chronicles 16.11, the Bible says, Seek the Lord in His strength. Seek His face continually. Amen? And I'm saying, really, uh, we, can, we can discuss the Nazarite vow and what God requires and and God wants us to be a people of the book and that doesn't negate the fact though that God is still God amen and he's a big God and he's something so much beyond us that's why we can approach him in prayer and he can sure answer us in power. And in John chapter 19, we see where even when Jesus was there before Pilate. In verse 10, John 19, 10, Then said, saith Pilate unto him, Speakest thou not unto me, knowest thou not that I have power to crucify thee, and have power to release thee? Jesus answered, Thou couldst have no power at all against me, except it were given thee from above. Therefore, he that hath delivered me unto thee hath the greater sin. And from thenceforth Pilate sought to release him. But the Jews cried out, saying, If thou let this man go, thou art not a king, uh, thou art not Caesar's friend, whosoever maketh himself a king against a king speaketh against Caesar. Well, they sure, <laughs> the people sure uh, could see clearly where the issue was, amen. And a lot of Baptists have trouble even with rendering to Caesar what belongs to Caesar and unto God what belongs to God. But it's important you recognize this simple truth that in the Old Testament, now in the New Testament, the Holy Spirit can come upon a person and stay on that person and stay in that person. Because in the New Testament, see, uh, we're sealed unto the day of redemption. In the New Testament, there's a circumcision 
which is the operation of God. There's a cutting away of the flesh that did not take place in the Old Testament. Jesus hadn't died for anybody's sins yet. So you can honestly say that like we saw here with Samson, that the Spirit had kind of a come and go ministry in the Old Testament. He did not come upon a believer and stay in a believer like he does with us that are born again in the New Testament era. And so there's a real difference between the Old Testament and the New Testament. I finally was able to get our new Bibles and take them up to that little group home that I've told you about where Stevie is. And it was nice that uh, I could sit down with him and his friend Mark and say, well, here, Mark, I got you a Bible now. And, uh, and then there was another fellow named Danny, and he wanted to join us. And he says, I can't read. I'm autistic. But he's a big old boy, and he's pretty smart. And I said, well, I think you could learn to read. I said, here, let me get you one of these big Bibles, too, Amen. with the big print. Amen. So I put his name in it. And uh, so we started a Bible study yesterday. And we started with Revelation chapter 1 and got all the way down to Revelation 1.8. And uh, they were getting hungry. Mark jumped up, started making him something in the kitchen. And so I said, well, that might be a good spot to stop right here at verse 8. And, uh, but we had a nice little Bible study we started there. But one of the things we took them in a few moments to do was explain to them, now see, this is the Old Testament, and this is the New Testament. Because Mark said there were some parts there that he kind of gets confused and it sounds like something's contradicting itself. And I said, well, yeah, that's true. Uh, because many people don't understand the simple truth. That, see, there's two sections here. This is the Old Testament. This is the New Testament. And the Bible has 66 books total. And of all the books, this is the only book here in Revelation 1.5, this is the only book, the book of Revelation, where God has promised you if you read it and if you hear somebody else read it, God is going to bless you. And yet I've been in many people, many, many people's, uh, I've talked to many people and they've told me, they said, oh, my preacher tells me uh, we don't read the book of Revelation in our church. And he tells us not to read the book of Revelation. And I said, well, I can see why the Catholics don't want you to read the book of Revelation. Because you don't need the Catholic Church. In the first, in Revelation 1, like verse 7 or so, he says clearly there, Jesus has washed us in his own blood. See, I don't need no Catholic priest to wash me from my sins. Amen. I don't need no church to wash me. Jesus has done wash me. Now I'm a king and a priest. I'm going to rule and reign with it. Thank God for Jesus. Jesus has saved me. He made me his child. And he's washed me in his own blood. Wash my sins away. So the Spirit would come and go in the Old Testament. Uh, oftentimes, again, the guy could kind of have to be clean, but yet, boy, once he touched sin or committed something that was sin, well, the Holy Spirit had to leave him. Uh, you know, he'd have to make some kind of things right, and then maybe the Holy Spirit could come back. But... The Holy Ghost definitely had a come and go ministry and it was probably because again the flesh was still attached to the uh, soul and spirit in the Old Testament as opposed to the New Testament circumcision of Colossians chapter 2. And um, see that's a New Testament thing. It's not in the Old Testament. And so let's look, let's look at a few proof texts and see these things. Because these are Bible doctrines and Bible doctrine is what separates us from all the other cults and schisms and isms that are out there because again we're living in a day where uh, doctrine is downplayed and thank God for Jesus teaching us his doctrine and God's doctrine. 1 Corinthians chapter 16 verse 14 here we see but the spirit of the Lord departed from Saul and an evil spirit from the Lord troubled him and Saul's servant said unto him behold now an evil spirit from God troubleth thee See, in the Old Testament, the Spirit would come and go, even as it did on their first king, King Saul. Um, we think of David when he sinned against God and the terrible things that he did when he uh, committed adultery with Bathsheba. And uh, had her husband killed. 
and murdered. I mean, David, uh, really, buddy, whew, you know, the bigger you are, the, the, the farther you fall. In Psalms 51, he said this when he was praying, trying to get right with God. He said, cast me not away from thy presence and take not thy Holy Spirit from me. They were definitely a free will Baptist in the Old Testament in the sense that they believed you could definitely lose your salvation and you could lose the power of the Holy Ghost because they knew it was a fact in the Old Testament. And that's why kind of you can pity our free will Baptist friends that believe in losing their salvation in the New Testament because the Bible does teach that yes, they did in the Old Testament and they will again in the tribulation period. There's no doubt about it. Even New Testament Christians will lose um, their salvation and lose the Holy Ghost if they take the name, number, or mark the beast according to the Bible in Revelation 14 and several other places. Um, now, but we're in this period of grace and of the church uh, before the tribulation to where the Bible doesn't teach any such thing as a falling away from the Lord's salvation because it's not our salvation we've saved ourselves from. It's his, his salvation. And, uh, and that's what Paul, David said here in verse 12, restore to me the joy of thy salvation. See, David knew it wasn't his salvation. He didn't save himself. But he was depending on God to do the saving. And God did save him. And then David, of all the people in the Old Testament, who, and he knew he rightfully deserved the Holy Ghost to leave him, Yet he did have what the Bible calls the sure mercies of David, and the Holy Ghost did not leave him. <laughs> Though the Holy Ghost had every right to leave him when he committed murder. And um, so God had David's kind of like as a picture and a type of us, a New Testament Christian, in the New Testament age when Jesus would call his disciples into this uh, beautiful thing. And here we are in the book of Acts, and that book of Acts is continuing with us even today until finally that tribulation will begin and we'll see Jesus' final, final revelation to the world as the book of Revelation tells us. Look at John 14 in verse 16. John 14, 16. John 14, 16. And I will pray the Father, and he shall give you another comforter, that he may abide with you, what, till you sin again? No, that he may abide with you forever. Jesus promised his disciples. Jesus promised his church that we still are a part of today. See? Even the spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it seeth him not, neither knoweth him, but ye know him, for he dwelleth with you. See, and see even with the, with the apostles, uh, during the life of Jesus, the Holy Spirit was with them, and the Holy Spirit could show them things. But now the Holy Spirit didn't necessarily come in them and stay in them like he w did after Jesus, of course, resurrection. But ye shall know him, for he dwelleth with you and shall be in you. See, See, eventually he'd take up residence inside the believer and stay in the believer because there's going to be a circumcision, the operation of God made without hands like Colossians 2 promised us. So it's important that you see that and you understand that. It'll help you from being confused. I was so blessed this week. Again, I had to take the children uh, to a... Uh, to be judged, our band, our middle school band, we had to take them up to be judged compared to the other school. And boy, the other schools were all complaining to our school. Oh man, these judges are tough. Oh man, the, that, that third judge, man, he's tough. He keeps giving twos. He ain't giving no ones to nobody. And yet our band went through there. We got all ones. It was, uh, it was fantastic. You know? And so our kids were very, very happy. And they did a good job too. I listened to them and it was a blessing. And uh, they did a, like I said, they always end up doing a church song. And I love that, of course. And uh, so it was a good time. But I had the opportunity, you know, to take uh, this lady to breakfast, the other driver. And, and uh, I led her to the Lord here recently. And, 
and I said, um, let me explain to you some things now. Uh, have you ever read the Bible very much in your lifetime? Well, I've tried a few times, and uh, I sometimes get pretty confused what's going on. I said, well, that's understandable if you don't read it systematically and from beginning to end each book. And I said, but I want to teach you a little something this morning that might help you. And I want to teach you the difference between the kingdom of God and the kingdom of heaven. Because, you know, you hear a lot of stuff at church. And I know you go to church. But I know the kind of church you go to. And I know you can stay very much confused in your church. <laughs> Especially any version but a King James. So I wanted to help learn this simple, simple basic idea that, you know, Genesis 1-1 says, In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. And see... And that's the way it's always been. And heaven didn't create God. It's God who created heaven. And heaven is a real, visible, physical place. You can see the birds fly in the heavens. You can look up and see stars in the heavens. You can see clouds in the heavens. Because heaven is a real, physical, visible place. And so there's a thing in the Bible, and it's called the kingdom of heaven. And what that's a reference to is someday when the king of heaven comes down to the earth and this king of heaven is going to set up and rule the world for 1,000 years, it says in the book of Revelation. It says it six times. He's going to run the world for 1,000. And this is this kingdom of heaven. It's coming to the earth. And when Jesus was here the first time, the Jews were obsessed with only one thing. Jesus, please tell us when the kingdom of heaven will be on earth. And Jesus, he, he definitely was a gentleman. And so he began to explain to the Jews. I said, myself, I said, as a, I remember as a teenager, going to my room, picking up my Bible, reading through the book of Matthew, getting to chapter 5, chapter 6, chapter 7. I'm reading this thing called the Sermon on the Mount, and I am totally confused. Then Jesus began to speak unto them and said, uh, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And I think to myself, now this is, wow, this is confusing. This isn't how to go to heaven. I've seen what Paul said, how you can call on the Lord and be saved. John 3, 16, you believe on the Lord Jesus and be saved. I know what the Bible says. But how come Jesus didn't tell these people how to go to heaven? Instead, he's talking to them about the kingdom of heaven because he's answering the Jews' questions when he's going to bring up in this, and he's actually giving them the rules to his kingdom here in Matthew 5, 6, and 7. He's talking about when is it he's going to bring in this thousand year reign of Christ and finally this promised kingdom for the Jews when the Jews will rule the world is going to be here. So see, God created the heaven and the earth, but the heaven didn't create God. So there's a difference when you read in your Bible about the kingdom of God versus the kingdom of heaven. The kingdom of heaven is a thousand year reign of Christ, but the kingdom of God, well, God is a spirit, Jesus said in John 4. And they that worship him, worship him in spirit and truth. So when you get born again, when you get saved, like Nicodemus was told by Jesus, that's how you get plugged into the God's invisible kingdom. You're in the kingdom of God when you get saved. It's here right now. It's invisible to us, but there are angels and devils. So like God is a spirit, there's a spiritual kingdom, and then there's a physical kingdom of heaven on earth when Jesus brings it down. And so that might help you not be so confused when you read these things in the Bible. Because the Bible talks about these differences. Now the sad thing is, I don't know what the new versions say. I'm sure it's sloppy in the new versions it's kingdom of heaven and God all the same because they don't know how to make the difference. But thank God for a King James Bible that always makes a difference. And I told her how the Bible says the kingdom of, of um, God is without observation. And how that the, Paul said the kingdom of God is within you. Well, see, the kingdom of heaven is definitely going to be with observation. You're going to see Jesus riding a white horse and coming down to earth setting up the millennial reign, and even having the marriage supper of the Lamb. You definitely see the kingdom of heaven. But the kingdom of God, oh no, it's an invisible kingdom like Jesus said in John 4, and John 3, I mean, to Nicodemus, it's like wind. You see it affecting things, but 
it's an invisible kingdom. And so the Bible speaks of how, yes, the Jews will someday see Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob sitting down in the kingdom, but they themselves thrust out of the kingdom. The children of the kingdom won't even get to partake in the kingdom. Because, see, there is a kingdom coming, but it's coming with an observation, and it's coming with people literally sitting down at a marriage supper. And so it's important you know those differences so that you don't get them all gobbledygooked up. And so I, I thought, uh, this will be a blessing to this gal if she's listening, if she can apply it. Amen. And so it is Samson, the spirit come and go, and would come and go. And so let's take a look now. Let's get into our text here of Judges. And we saw where uh, he, he didn't know that the Lord had departed from him. He just tried to shake himself as at other times, and it didn't do any good. And so, we see that the Philistines took his, put his eyes out, so let's go ahead and finish this. So we'll start at 21, read down to the end of the chapter today. It's chapter 16. But the Philistines took him and put out his eyes and brought him down to Gaza. Amen. Okay, you want to zoom in on my screen, uh, Charity, and I'll, uh, I'll have this running while we read it. This is so awesome. I'll see if I can get this going here. I love this scene uh, of old Samson tearing the house down. Amen. So it says here, yes, Philistines took him, put out his eyes. Uh, we don't need all that sound. He put his eyes out and brought him down to Gaza, bound him with fetters of brass. He did grind in the prison house. Howbeit the hair of his head began to grow again after he was shaven. And then the lords of the Philistines gathered them together for, to offer a great sacrifice unto Dagon their God and to rejoice. For they said, Our God hath delivered Samson, our enemy, into our hand. And when the people saw him, they praised their God. For they said, Our God hath delivered him into our hands, our enemy, and the destroyer of our country, which slew many of us. And it came to pass, when their hearts were, notice this word, I hope you underline it and mark it well, and their hearts were merry. Amen. You're going to find that verse again in uh, Revelation 11.10. When the two street preachers are seen slain in the street of Jerusalem. That, that they said, call for Samson that he may make a sport. And they called for Samson out of the prison house. And he made them sport and they set him between the pillars. And Samson said unto the lad that held him by the hand, Suffer me that I may fill the pillars whereupon the house standeth, that I may lean upon them. Now the house was full of men and women, and all the lords of the Philistines were there. And there were upon the roof about 3,000 men and women that beheld while Samson made sport. And Samson called unto the Lord and said, O Lord God, remember me, I pray thee, and strengthen me, I pray thee. Only this once, O God, that I may be at once avenged of the Philistines for my two eyes. And Samson took hold of the two middle pillars upon which the house stood, and on which it was borne up, of the one with his right hand and the other with his left. And Samson said, Let me die with the Philistines. And he bowed himself with all his might, and the house fell upon the lords and upon all the people that were therein. So the dead which he slew at his death were more than they which he slew in his life. Then his brethren and all the house of his father came down and took him and brought him up and buried him between Zorah and Ashtol in the burying place of Manoah his father. And he judged Israel 20 years. Amen. All right. Well, let's pray. Lord, again, help us to believe what the Bible says 
and be a person of faith like Samson. In Jesus' name we ask it, and amen. Amen. So interesting that again, Samson ended up dying the death, and in a real sense, he paid his vows to the Lord, and I believe he kind of negotiated and worked that out with God so that he ends up becoming the ram himself, since it was a he lamb and a she lamb that was required the cutting of his hair, and even a ram, so that he is listed in Hebrews chapter 11 as one of the heroes of the faith. And uh, I believe if the Holy Ghost had left him, that the Holy Ghost came back. <laughs> and that God got great delight in his ending because in him sacrificing himself, uh, we know he ended up taking the lives of so many of those Philistines. And of course, it was interesting that God got real interested when they started bragging. And pagans, buddy, when they start bragging about their God, and they start bragging about what their God is able to do, when they start glorifying their false God, God usually attacks with a vengeance. Amen? <laughs> God is the true God. And... Uh, he is happy to make a display of how the false gods are false. Isaiah 42 and verse 8. I am the Lord, that is my name, and my glory will I not give to another, neither my praise to graven images. Amen? Amen. He's not into giving praise to graven images. And you do wrong when you think you're helping God out with these silly aids of worship. Now, Samson reveals the dangers of fleshly living. And he completed the judgment for violating his Nazarite vow. He requested vengeance for himself and died a tragic suicide. Yet he was mildly used of God because, sure enough, in Hebrews chapter 11... We find that he's listed here in these, uh, among these heroes of the faith because, again, like I said, uh, I believe that he got the power back. Hebrews 11 and verse 32. And what shall I more say for the time would fail me to tell of Gideon and of Barak and of Samson and of Jephthah of David also, and Samuel, and of the prophets, who through faith subdued kingdoms, wrought righteousness, obtained promises, stopped the mouths of lions, quenched the violence of fire, escaped the edge of the sword, out of weakness were made strong, waxed valiant in fight, turned to flight the armies of the aliens. Amen. And so we've got a great heritage in standing up against the aliens. Amen. I should put that verse on our website. Amen. <laughs> and so it's interesting that the Bible tells us that, yes, uh, they, heard they had him grinding at the mill. Normally that was work for women. That was work for slaves. See? Uh, maybe they had a donkey or somebody doing it. But they could unhook the donkey and make Samson do it. And it was very laborious for him because, again, he didn't have the power of God on him like he used to. And yet, it's day by day as he's going round and round, grinding at that mill, I believe uh, he was talking to God and God was talking to him and God and he made some arrangements. And it's interesting that his brethren, probably his uh, parents were now dead. So come with some of his kinfolk, they came down to Gaza. And the truth is, I even, went before I put this thing together on my computer, I saw where there's a man in Gaza today. He was showing, here's some of the original temple, Dagon temple stones laying right here in the ground still to this day that Samson knocked down. Still land there. Uh, 
but I didn't click that one today. I thought this would be a little more entertaining, you know. And uh, so, you know, Dagon, the fish god. Now, what's interesting is, see, the Catholic Church has emulated this same false god because they came up with this idea. What they did is they'd wear a martyr, they'd wear one of these these uh, pope hats like on their head, they, and that way, see, it was, you know, it goes up here in the front, and then it's open. So that from the side, it looks like the open mouth of a fish. The man walking around with a robe on and a big flowing robe uh, with a train behind him. See, that would look like a fish. It's like a fish standing on its tail. And these guys were all a part of this Dagon, the fish god, because it was this idea of a, the head of a man in the chest and arms of a man, but the tail of a fish. And the truth is, people are still worshiping this god today. They're getting in their boats, headed out in Lake Erie. They fish every day. There's people who worship fishing. And there's people who worship the fish god. Amen. And they got their boats. And it's all about fishing. And they just worship fishing. Fishing. And Sundays are going fishing days. And uh, people are still worshiping, day, worshiping Dagon today. So the Catholic priests, they had these things. Of course, uh, of course, the Pope, you know, he's got a hat he puts on. It says X, X, it says L, X, X. It says... It has. It was writing in, in in Roman numerals, and of course you add up the numerals that it used to wear. It always said six 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 on it, and so for centuries, uh, the Protestants and people would point to the Pope, and people could clearly add the numbers up of what it, his hat said, since it said he's the Vicar of Christ, and you could add up the C's and the X's and the I's, and of course it would add up to six six six. For centuries. Bible-believing Christians would just point to the Pope because he'd get all dressed up in his fancy fish god hat, you know, and though that's all crusted with silver and go gems, and, and uh, they'd say, see, just, re just read the numbers on his hat. He is 666. So for centuries, Bible-believing Christians have known that the Pope is the Antichrist. Uh, now, of course, again, there's always this push in modern times to cover all this up and uh, say, oh, no, that's just, leth that's just myths and legends of Protestants. But no, 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 that's just, that's just Bible. And uh, about World War II is when finally the Catholics got smart and realized, you know, we're cutting our own throat. Somebody needs to tell the Pope, quit wearing that stuff and only wear it on special occasions like when he becomes Pope and stuff. So, so he don't wear it all the time like they used to because, again, they were cutting their own throat. And many Catholics were joining Baptist churches and Bible-believing churches because it was easy to spot who the Antichrist was for centuries. And uh, so it's been a little more uh, difficult in these modern times because he don't wear that clown suit as much as he used to to where he's walking around looking like a fish walking around on his tail. And, uh, but it's interesting because back there it says his brethren and all the house of his father came down, took him and brought him up and buried him between Zora and Ashtol in the burying place of Manoah, his father. And of course, the truth is, if you remember back in chapter 13, verse 25, that's where the spirit had first come upon him. Back there when he ripped that lion in half. So you see, he ends up, he, again, it's interesting that uh, verse 25 of 13, the Spirit of the Lord began to move him at times in the camp of Dan between Zorah and Ashtol. And uh, the Bible says that he judged Israel 20 years. And uh, so that was the life of the Lone Ranger. The Lone Ranger Judge. The life of Samson. Sunny Boy. Sunshine. Judges 13.5 says, Yes, for lo, thou shalt conceive, bear a son, and no razor shall come on his head. For the child shall be a Nazarite unto God from the womb, and he shall begin to deliver Israel out of the hand of the Philistines. Notice there it says he shall begin. Because again, he had a good beginning of delivering Israel. 
But the truth is, uh, you didn't see Israel joining ranks behind him very much and helping him. He was a lone ranger. Amen? He was a lone ranger judge. Um, I personally believe that it's because, you know, he was a little bit too friendly with the Philistines. <laughs> And his people kind of knew that God wanted them to stay separated and not fool with them Philistines so much. And uh, that's probably why he couldn't quite get a following uh, like the other judges did. All right, so we'll stop right there and pick up 17 next week. Anything you want to add or anything, any questions you might have for us? Uh, talking about Mr. Sampson. Quite a character, amen? He was quite the character. And um, Lord help us to not be so self-willed as he was to stay clean and stay close and repent when we do wrong and not try to get away with nothing, amen? All right, let's pray. Lord help us now. And we so are thankful for Samson that we have him in the Bible to uh, be warned not to fool with sin, not to fool with Delilah's, not to fool around with these uh, strange women and to stay clean and stay in your word and stay true to your word. And in Jesus' name we ask it. Amen. Amen.